So you're picking up one of these or you're planning to pick up one of these. I'm gonna go through every little thing that you need when you're getting your first camera. Like you've never got into this stuff before and either you have it or you're preparing to buy it. But if you plan to buy one of these, don't. You're gonna waste your money. Those everything kits are complete and total trash. So I'm gonna go through all of the accessories, all of the different things that you actually truly will need. And I'm telling you, you do not wanna cut corners when it comes to the stuff that I wanna be talking about because essentially you'll buy it twice. You'll buy the cheap thing, it won't work and it won't work well, or you'll spend and waste time looking for tutorials on how to fix and remove noise and issues from the audio because the mic is not necessarily too cheap in price, it's just too cheap in quality and it's not working or you're buying something else because you found it on Facebook Marketplace. I've been there, I've done it, bought things two and three times over. I'm gonna give you the exhaustive list Let's dive in. Now, just so you know, none of this is going to be in the right order. In the right order, it would be audio, your lighting, and then the camera. But since you already got this, let's just go ahead and keep everything out of order. So first things first, you're going to need memory cards. You need these to go in the camera so that you can do exactly what I'm doing now. Take the data and the information and put one of these into your computer. Why you need one of these, like, and if you, especially if you got one of those everything kits or wherever you bought it, it came with one. Unless it is like a SanDisk Extreme or a SanDisk Extreme Pro, one of these cards that I have in my hand, don't bother. Because some of these cheaper cards that you will find that's a lot of storage, even though uh, it came for free or whatever, most of the time it does not have the capacity to record in the way that you need to. It's gonna break the files up and it's just gonna be a mess. Uh, so don't do it. Keep that card as a backup, but you don't wanna keep that card and consistently use it. Just assume then pretty much pretend you don't have it. The next thing that you're going to need back of that to put that SD card in your computer is one of these. These are SD card readers. You have this one that's a USB 3.0 and this one that is a USB-C. This is the newer one. I would prefer that if you're going to invest in one of these, go ahead and get these simply because the design and the space that you're going to need later on as you're creating, this is too wide. Most computers don't have the port size for the USB 3.0 anymore. So USB-C is the way to go. You'll stay good for however far you choose to advance and this can go up to a UHS-2 card. I know that doesn't mean anything to you right now, but this is one of those things where you buy it right or you buy it twice. Even if you get this one, this is still really good. It's just gonna need to go in some kind of adapter or converter to get it to this kind of a width and space and things like that. The way that this works is you take your SD card and you put this into your card reader. These work best when you have a SanDisk card and a SanDisk card reader you will get the maximum speeds when you're transferring that data from the card to the actual computer. The numbers that you see on the front of the card don't mean anything when it comes to the use in the camera. It's for that transferring speeds that it will be quickly. In order to know how fast it writes to the card, to the camera, that's the number you need to look into the description or details. And I've done some videos about that, uh, even micro content on Instagram about that. But just know that this is a card or a series of cards that you can use for a long time. They're very budget friendly. Go ahead and grab the 64 gigabytes or more. Honestly, 128 is the, gigabytes is where you wanna start. Don't do anything less. Trust me, 120 gig, gigabytes or better, it's choice. The next thing that you wanna get is a tripod. Now, I know that this becomes something that a lot of people talk about on YouTube, and you'll see a bunch of variations from like travel tripods and stuff like that. If you're mostly going to be doing videos indoors, traveling just like around town or whatever, you don't need anything special, like you don't plan to do any kind of panning or tilting for a fluid motion, you can get an Amazon Basics 50 inch if you're like five feet and under, and if you're five, five and taller, go ahead and get the Amazon Basics 60 inch. And I use the Amazon Basics 60 inch and have used it since like 2018. And this is what's used for my live streaming tripod. It doesn't move, it doesn't go anywhere. And even when it did, it's solid enough that it can handle it. The difference between a tripod that the legs individually expand or fold up on itself is the fact that you'll be able to travel with it more efficiently. The legs can go beyond the little brace that's in the middle and you can spread it out to get a lower angled shot or just completely, completely lay it flat. That's not something that you honestly will need if you're just doing a bunch of indoor videos, but when you're traveling, it is good to get a bunch of different angles. Whether or not you should get the Amazon Basics style of tripods, or if you should get the other kind of more travel friendly, just more all terrain use, if you will, kind of a tripod, it depends on what your use case is. Do you plan to travel with it? Because for me, 
If I had to do it all over again, I would get the Amazon Basics 60 inch tripod for exactly what it's used for right now, indoors, doesn't go anywhere. I don't ever need it for anything other than like live streaming and maybe the occasional backup, but at this point I don't. And then I would get the Suray 5C travel tripod that I have right now because it's really good, really portable, extremely light. And yes, it is $100, but that $100 has been well, well used for the amount of efficiency that it builds back into the time that I need for a tripod. You think it's not that serious, but it's not until you need a good tripod for something that it actually matters. Now I actually did a full video on tripods and just the difference between like choosing them. So if you wanna check that video, I'll link it down in the description. Next up is gonna be microphones. And it's not just a microphone, it's three categories of microphones that you actually need. You need a lapel microphone system, you need a shotgun microphone system, which is a microphone like this. These are mini shotgun microphones that you can use, put it on top of the camera. You'll usually see these with like wind furries on top of them for vlogging, things like that. If you're planning to do a video like this and you're about a foot or two away from the camera, anything more than that, you need to go to a lapel. And then you need a podcast style microphone. That's gonna be great for any interviews, live streams, or just content at your desk where you're guaranteed to get great audio. And if you ever plan to do like a video podcast or something, that's the way to go. Now, when it comes to lapel microphones, my recommendation is to go with the Rode Wireless Go 2 systems. We've talked about this. With the previous versions, they have a Rode Wireless Go 1 and a Rode Wireless Go 2. You can even get this where it's just one receiver, one transmitter, but go ahead and get the one for two, just because you never know what you may want to do and it's just better to get the whole package deal. They do have it where it comes with the Rode Lavalier Go, where with this lapel microphone, this is exactly what you're hearing right now. This system is incredible. It records internally, so I can do things like this, which is be away or further away from the camera and have it continue to recording and picking up audio. Or I can have this hooked up for two different people where my buddy Doc Rock and I, we were in Albany, New York at People of Video 2021, and he can have a microphone on and I can have a microphone on. It's individually recorded, synced up, and a ton of other goodness. Yes, there are cheaper ways to split the audio and and do all these other budget friendly things. But the thing with hacks is that at some point they will crack and they will break. So hacks will crack. You want to get systems that once you buy it once, you're done. The key though is get a good lapel microphone. Maybe you don't invest in the wireless kit just yet. You can even get the pop voice lapel microphone. If you have a very strong or a very deep or loud voice, you may not want to get it because it's a little bit too strong. There is the purple panda lapel microphone and we did an entire video comparing the lapel microphones but i would say go listen to some videos around youtube people that have that kind of microphone that you're considering and do they have a voice type like yours because sometimes you'll invest in what is a good microphone but it's not a good microphone for your voice now shotgun microphones are a different beast you can technically use the Rode wireless goes as a shotgun microphone just put like the little wind muff on there it works great i've done that before and this is the movo vxr 10 it only has the one 3.5 millimeters for the actual microphone port, but I love this microphone. I've been using it since like 2019. And they have the Movo VXR10 Pro, and this one has a microphone port and a headphone port on the back. And this is really neat and nifty when you have a microphone situation where you need to check your audio. A camera like this, the Sony A6400, it doesn't actually have where you have a headphone port. Unlike the ZV-E10, sometimes you can have audio issues. Your audio meters will not see audio interference and it won't move up and down. The thing is, you need to be able to listen for that. Having a headphone port makes a ton of difference. You can probably pass on a shotgun microphone for right now, but the thing is to consider, if you were gonna move into doing one and like using the Rode Video Micro, that's another very popular option, which situation or scenario does this make the most sense in? If you're vlogging one to two feet away from the camera, this is the best bet. Anything that is further away, you need to be looking at close audio situations. Otherwise, it's going to sound like you're talking from across the room. The last category is a podcast style microphone. This is going to be something like the Samsung Q2U or the Shure MV7. I use the Shure SM7B and that's an XLR only microphone. The reason why I say the Shure MV7 or the Samsung Q2U is because these two microphones in particular have a USB and a XLR, which means you don't need any kind of a setup, audio preamps or anything like that. You just go ahead and connect it from the microphone to the computer 
and you're done. But if you go into a more traditional setup, let's say you go do a talk and you need to have a microphone, you can do that. When you get into XLR only ones like the Rode Pod mic or the Shure SM7B, that is an XLR only situation and you need something like the Rodecaster Pro or the Scarlett 2i2 setup where it's going to basically take that analog and convert it into digital so that your computers and stuff read it. USB-C microphones, skip all of that. It has everything that it needs in the microphone and it sounds fantastic. I really recommend the Shure MB7. You buy it once and you're good. And if you upgrade your system, you won't need to upgrade the mic. The next setup is going to be lights. You may see where you have softbox lights or you have those photography umbrella lights. You really wanna stay away from those. Those are still okay to use, but honestly, they're not the best because when a lighting situation is too bright and your skin is too bright, you'll have what I call hot spots where the front parts of your face is just unrecognizable. It's just like a completely white out situation. You see this table and it is white, but you can actually see details of the table. Like it's not, in infinity white so where you can't tell what it is. So you need lights where you can adjust from it being maybe 10% up to 100% strength so you can control the lighting in your environment. This means getting a bi-color LED light. I recommend the Viltrox kit. Everything will be linked down in the description, but these will allow you to, especially depending on where you live, and nobody really talks about that, which is when you go from, let's say winter to summer, and just the quality of the lighting from the day to the afternoon changes. So if you're using window lighting or a portion of window lighting that you're letting come in, that temperature changes during the months. That means for me and my business, we have one set of light temperatures for one part of the year. So in the winter time, it's a bit warmer just to contrast and make it neutral. And then in the summertime, we adapt and we make it a little bit cooler. This is a little bit more than probably what you bargained for, but these are the things that you only come to know the more that you're recording. If you're recording in a basement, an office where it's no windows or they're tinted or something like that, so you're not using it, you'll have a situation where you have ceiling lights. This is actually just the ceiling light. Even though this is a daylight temperature light, if I didn't have anything else, yes, I could increase the brightness for the camera. Let's take this from ISO 125 to say ISO 800, I guess, or somewhere about here. If we're about here, yeah, I have a light, but it doesn't look great. It doesn't look the best. Alexa, turn the lights on. Whereas now where I have dedicated lighting in this space, in this environment, it looks way better. So you can utilize your lighting setup with your existing light, but you need to get daylight temperature bulbs. You can get this from any hardware store, order them from Amazon or wherever you prefer, but that way it will match whatever it is that you're using in your room. One little hack that I do enjoy is that if you get your lights first, you figure out what kind of Kelvins. For me, that ranges between 4,200 Kelvins and 4,500 Kelvins. Again, a little bit more advanced probably than what you bargained for, but I did a video on lighting already. You can check that out in the description. If I know it's 4,200 Kelvins, I'll go and get daylight temperature bulbs that are around 4,200 Kelvins if I can find them. You may find about where it just says daylight temperature, but no number. And that's okay. As long as it's daylight temperature light bulbs, you can work with them. So it's not negatively impacting your look and just honestly making it look weird. Next up is gonna be this white balance card. Doesn't seem like much because it condenses down to smaller than my hand. But when I pull this out and it pops open, I can now use this to set the white balance on my camera, handle the exposure, or anything else. So you can use the white side or the gray side. I've just come to use the gray side, both will work. And people will say use printer paper. It's not quite the same, simply because printer paper, it just doesn't get the job done. You really do need a gray card. This is $7. I've had this since like 2018 and it works. This is the best $7 you're gonna spend. And this, you will sit in front of your camera. It'll take a picture of it. This way you can get the temperature of the room, the environment and your lighting will match properly. So your skin tones, your whites actually look white and not like a yellowish hue to it. And your skin tones look normal. When you think about investing in something like a gray card, you, that means that you're getting out of automatic. 
when you're in automatic settings that if the sun comes out, if the clouds go or whatever happens from day to day, from video to video, every video looks different. There's no consistency in the quality of your brand. When you think about that, you really want to switch over to using a gray card. Get one of these. This is non-negotiable. The next thing that needs to be on your list of things to have is a replaceable battery or extra batteries. And you want to make sure you have an AC adapter. The reason why you want to have an AC adapter is so when you're doing videos like this, you can just take this. This is for the ZV-1. Plug this into your camera. This cord will now for these kind, you can go into a USB battery bank or it can go into the wall outlet. The other thing when it comes to batteries, a lot of people get suckered into buying a bunch of third party batteries, me too. But the thing is that those batteries are not worth the money most of the time. It's only one brand that's like tried and true and that is Wasabi batteries. Those are really good. But when it comes to getting batteries for me, just one other FW50 battery, like if it's the ZVE10 or A6400, or even for the Z batteries in the A6600, I just have one other battery. The way that I use my cameras is with a USB rechargeable bank. So get your actual camera brand's battery. One of these is usually worth two of some third party one. And yes, they're super cheap, but the fact that they will swell, people have messed up their cameras messing around with this stuff, but it's just not worth it. Ever since 2020, it is capture card season. You're gonna see a bunch of these cheap, random brand, $20 capture cards, and then you will find the tried and true Elgato Cam Link. The reason why I have this is for tutorials and stuff like that to where it's not that big of a deal so that I can share the camera screen, but I'm not relying on this kind of stuff when it comes to capture cards. And I would encourage you, don't either. People say, I use that, it looks fine. No, it doesn't. When you look at cameras and stuff like that, it'll have a magenta, which is like a purplish, reddish kind of a look, or it'll have like a lime green tint to it. It doesn't look the way it's supposed to, it's very shifted. That means your skin tones do also. So when you're switching from one camera angle to the other, if you are getting multiple cameras, this looks bad. And I get it in a pinch, a bunch of people needed these, but now you don't. Go ahead and get the Elgato Cam Links. What is your brand worth? Is it worth one of these $20 joints or is it worth something that you know you'll have for years that will actually work? Lastly on your list needs to be really good USB-C, USB micro and HDMI cables. These are some of the cables that you'll use most often. I'll put a link to my favorite brand down below. When you think about uh, using your camera via USB for live streaming, if that's the option that you wanna take, or you think about charging or any other capacity with transferring data, anything like that, you need the best cables, not what you already have lying around that may work, but you'll have delays where your audio and video is out of sync and you'll have all kind of latency issues. This is not what you wanna be dealing with when you're trying to produce content. Most people are already pressed for time. And in that sense, they're already burning time trying to get stuff to work. Don't do that, just get the right stuff. This seven or $10 pack, you can get them up to $20 where it comes with multiple lengths, extremely, extremely helpful. So you need data transferable cables so that it can transfer data from the camera to the computer or just whatever for live streaming setups and things like that. So if you made it this far in the video, it's a link down in the description where I'm gonna be giving you my accessories gear list where everything is listed or if you're ready to just check out and just buy everything, I put some Amazon shopping carts down below where you can just go and add all this stuff to the cart. But at the end of the day, when you think about investing in one of these there's a ton of other things that come with it and this is stuff that you'll find as you're like well how do i do this and how do i do that hopefully this video condenses time frames and condenses thing down for you so you don't have to go searching everywhere so a lot of people get distracted with gimbals and a bunch of other stuff that's fun but is it going to get the job done for your regular workflow and that's the stuff that i'm talking about the things that don't waste your time and they really are a good investment and pro tip that probably the other people won't see because they didn't get this far in the video is if you have the A6400, A61, A63, 65, whatever cameras, get one of these Sony remotes. This is great. This is how I can start and stop the video. I can zoom in and zoom out. And this keeps you from getting up, sitting down, getting up, sitting down, stuff like that. So get one of these. If you don't, and you have like the ZV-1 or the ZV-E10, I'll put a link to the other Bluetooth remote, remote in there. It doesn't allow you to do a bunch, but you can activate the clear image zoom and still do the zoom in, zoom out, start the recording, control like your audio levels and some other really cool stuff. So I'll do a video on that as well to check that out. But if you made it this far in the video, let me know. 
What is one thing that you wish that somebody would teach you or talk about when it comes to the video content creation? Put that down in the description. But if you want to check out the tripod videos that I did so that you don't waste money on just a bunch of weird ones that won't work or be too heavy, make sure you check out the video on the screen. You're going to love it.